Hey, everyone. I want to give a quick shout out to this episode's sponsor, Copper. Copper is an institutional custodian in crypto and provider of prime services. They're also one of my favorite companies in the space. So thank you very much to Copper for making this episode possible. You're going to be hearing all about them later in the show. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of On the Margin. Today, I'm joined by commodities and crypto trader Jonah Van Borg. Jonah, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me on, Mike. Nice to see you. Yeah, man. I am pumped. Uh, I'm pumped to be talking to you live uh, when usually you're on. I'm listening to you talk with Avi on the 1000X podcast. So this is a real treat for me as well. I appreciate you coming on. Yeah, yeah. For me too. I mean, first of all, thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Second of all, I love listening to On the Margin. And I, I love, um, you know, I love setting up 1000X with with you at at Blockworks. You you know, we've, we've collabed on some stuff. We work together already. You're, you, you know, great. I know, I, buddy. Congrats I know, I know on all gonna... the success at Blockworks, by the way. I, I can, you know, oh, having thanks. worked with you, I can see why you guys are doing as well as you're doing. Thanks, Fishing. dude. I appreciate you. Um, so I'm really excited about this conversation because, uh, for, first of all, definite plug to 1000X. Everyone go listen to that show. But uh, Jonah, for folks that don't know your background, you have sat in uh, you know, some very unique seats in being a very uh, well-established and successful trader of commodities. And then you moved over onto the crypto side of things at DRW, and you're now back in the commodities world. Can you just give listeners who might not be familiar with your particular background kind of a sense of your career, some of the markets that you've traded, and then we can get into a fun discussion of both the macro and segue that into crypto and Bitcoin a little bit. Yeah, totally. I mean, I've had, in my opinion, one of the most uh, one of the most interesting careers you could possibly have in finance, not on purpose. Uh, it just sort of happened by accident. And I wouldn't recommend that other people subject themselves to this level of chaos and turmoil, but I happen to go straight into the meat grinder and get spun around a few times. So I, I have some stories and some experience that I, I hope to share with, with any listeners who care. Um, I started right out of college at Lehman Brothers, which at the time was the hot up and coming you know, shop. We were, we were the princes of Wall Street about to dethrone Goldman, uh, in, in our opinions. And so then one year later, uh, you know, Lehman was bankrupt and we were all out on our asses. Uh, funny how that works. So I, I was a credit default swaps trader. So right, right during the financial wow. crisis, that was my intro to trading. Um, mostly I was just answering the phone and booking trades, but also doing a bit of trading. And then when Lehman blew up, um, <clears throat> you know, sitting on my couch, smoking weed, and then, uh, then Barclays, uh, bought Lehman out of bankruptcy. If, if you've read the history books, you know, this, um, so we all got an email saying from like Barclays Capital, you know, like HR at BarclaysCapital.com. Like if you would like a temporary offer of employment, please reply with accept in the subject line. Otherwise, please reply with reject. So, you know, unemployed 21 year old Jonah accepted the offer. Uh, I made my bread there by explaining during the every Friday, like the bobs from office space would come in and fire another thousand people because it's a big job to fire 20,000 people, right? So uh, I would re-interview for my job every Friday and um, I made my bread by basically explaining that I was the most proficient at Excel because I was the youngest and I was also the cheapest because I was the youngest. So I survived that. Um, then ended up getting stuffed into G10 FX options trading. Um, had a good run on Fukushima, that Japanese disaster, while I was on the dollar yen book. And then Goldman hired me uh, when they were looking for an options trader who was good and had had a good run to trade uh, their crude oil book, a big derivatives book in New York. So did that for four years, um, quoting the biggest oil flows in the world, uh, you know, Mexico's hedging program, Egypt, all sorts of other massive corporations, international and national oil companies and hedge funds, you know, uh, fam famous and not famous. Uh, through through some pretty chaotic times, including the big crash of 2014. Um, and then uh, a company called VTOL poached me in 2015. VTOL is the world's largest oil trading company. And I was a partner there for almost seven years uh, until crypto came knocking. And that's, uh, that's what I did at DRW. I was the global head of uh, crypto and precious metals trading there for two years. And I came back to commodities recently <clears throat> because of a pretty phenomenal opportunity that I got offered that sort of allows me to put together some of what I learned at VTOL and, and what I learned at DRW, uh, as well as the fact that if you're crypto trading, you know, the regulatory heat in the kitchen is pretty noticeable. So uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's pretty scary. You know, I think you look at some of, some of my competitors in the, you know, global head of trading at, at crypto shop type categories, and some of those people are in... Uh, uh, you know, 
in in situations I would I would not want to put my family through. So yeah, it's time time to time to run at, at a certain point. I think I might uh, know who. Maybe there's something specific that you're referring <laughs> yeah. to. There. We'll just we'll, we'll uh, have them remain nameless. All right, so Jen, I want want to get into your your overall sort of macro framework moving into this year, but. One place that I want to take this conversation is the intersection of commodities and crypto, specifically through the eyes of a trader. So can you give us a sense of like the Venn diagram of skill sets, what it takes to be a good commodity trader, what it takes to be a good crypto trader? How close are those two circles together? Is there a lot of overlap? Like, how do you think about that? Great question. And thank you for caring. I'm so passionate about these two niche topics. It's almost no one no one else seems to Dude, care. I care a so. lot. I, this is going to lead somewhere. I promise you. I've actually written on this. I'm very, I'm very curious. I'm stoked. So my overarching thesis is that the crypto and commodity markets are going to merge. That's why I was so excited to learn about crypto and and take professional risk trading it. I think that crypto and crypto is a commodity, right? Like the reason why I jumped into crypto in the first place was because it started to look f- familiar to me, right? Like ETH in 2021, you could buy it or you could mine it. In and of itself, the you know, Ether token isn't particularly useful, but if you refine it via effectively spending a little bit of it as gas, uh, you can basically turn it into a useful product or a service like, um, you know, earning yield on your on your you know, savings or uh, owning a certificate of authenticity for a digital good called an NFT. Effectively, like crude oil in and of itself isn't particularly useful either uh, until you refine it into all these amazing things that make the world turn like jet fuel and gasoline. So to me, it was like, all right, this is a commodity. I get it. <clears throat> and, you know, other things that are at the overlapping of the Venn diagram are you know, the volatility of these two asset classes. They're actually quite similar. Bitcoin and Bitcoin and crude oil vol are, are about, you know, 30, 40 percent. Pretty, pretty similar stuff. Trading liquid, uh, liquid markets with that are high in volatility is something that you hone as a commodities trader. And as a crypto trader, and they're actually quite similar skill sets. The the mindset that you have to be able to develop, the discipline in order to manage risk in these markets that are constantly freaking you out, right? It translates from crypto to commodities and vice versa. So <clears throat> what are the, what are sort of the top skills that you need to be a successful commodities trader or crypto trader? Number one is discipline. And that's that applies to any market. You have to be an extremely disciplined person because every 15 seconds, the market's going to either try to distract you or do something to your PL that's going to make you want to panic or stop out or add on the highs or buy low. I'm sorry, buy high and sell low. Just stupid stuff, right? So you have to you have to be disciplined. Uh, thing number two that I think is really consistent across both markets is you have to have a very technical and not by technical I don't mean like uh, charts and moving averages. You have to have a you know, a quantitative bent. You have to have an approach to understanding the fundamentals of your market, be it, you know, on-chain data or supply and demand data, and then translate that via, you know, either simple or complex math into trading strategies that you can cling to even when you're losing money. So it's like a very sort of rigorous technical approach. And then finally, I think the thing that's that's most important um, that that's sort of at the intersection of the, you know, commodities and crypto is just this... Um, this sort of eagerness and curiosity to solve the pu- puzzle of these ultimately very complicated but very interesting ecosystems in crypto it's you know it's a, a lattice work of software all sort of communicating to create this computer with tradable digital commodities sort of you know flying around back and forth in a way that that everybody and nobody kind of kind of owns the network and then in commodities it's actually basically the same thing except instead of bits it's atoms it's this decentralized network of you know fungible hydrocarbons or gas molecules, uh, which are, you know, sort of, <clears throat> let's call them gaseous hydrocarbons or, you know, metals or whatever. And they're sort of, it's like a decentralized network owned by the world, by everybody and by nobody kind of flying around creating this sort of form of physical computation. So I think it's, it's just the curiosity about, about those markets from the bottom up that, that makes you a success. And I've seen many people come in just to finish the thought sort of from the top down, assuming they know everything, um, because they, they've either, you know, been market makers or they've just seen some shit on Twitter and and uh, ultimately that fails. You have to you have to understand the these markets bottom up. Like you do, Mike, you explore the fundamentals. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. I um well, I, you know, part of the reason I was so excited to to chat with you is actually I wrote this, you know, because I get if if you've been in crypto for a little while, you have this um experience of being asked usually by like your parents, friends or something, 
hey, like, what is crypto? And even, you know, I've been in this industry full time for six years, and I still get a little panic because I don't have this comprehensive way of describing what I think this industry is. And what I've landed on is I think it's the creation of a new digital commodity, which is basically block space. Like that's the innovation here. And these things trade like commodities. And actually, an enormous amount of people's objection uh, to crypto is that it doesn't produce, it's a speculative asset, right? It doesn't produce some amount of cash flows. And there's actually a really great quote, uh, Eric Balkuna shared this from Jack Bogle about why he's not a fan of commodities. And this, this is the quote from Jack Bogle. Commodities are a real loser's game. He told me in the long run, they have no internal rate of return. You buy a commodity. Gold is a good example. You're betting you can sell it to someone for more than you paid for it. And it's just funny. I mean, that's like, a, it, it was interesting to hear that because I'm so used to hearing that within the the context of crypto. And that's a lot of what I think these L1s are. There's, and we're probably looking at some sort of commodity boom. This is the very first, and you have these sort of commodity boom cycles like the 1970s and 80s during the stagflationary period. You saw it in the 2000s as well. Um, so that's, it's just interesting to hear you describe them exactly like that, because that is my mental framework for, you know, it's interesting. I mean, if you have a, an ETF, was it Jack Bogle? You said, who said that? Jack Bogle. Yeah, yeah. So you have an ETF pioneer saying, I don't like commodities. Like, sure. Okay. So it's not an investable asset class that always goes up like the S and P right. 500, you know, but it, yeah, oil, oil during the, the, you know, the sort of 2020 to 2022 cycle uh, went from, you know, $15 a barrel to 140. That's a 10 Xer in, in, in less than two years, like run your IRR on that Jack Bogle. Right. So basically <laughs> the thing about, the thing about commodities, uh, trading is that there's often this stigma around it, right? Oh, because from the investment community, which is, it doesn't always go up, which provides this fantastic opportunity for commodities traders to get in there and actually understand the fundamentals and time it and and buy low and sell high and and earn those returns that the investment community leaves behind because it isn't quite that easy. Now, on the other hand, with uh, with with commodities, you know, yes, it's a it, let's call it a zero drift asset class, as crypto may be at times. But what I compare crypto to is, you know, if anybody's read the Prize, this um, by Daniel Jurgen, this Pulitzer Prize winning book about the the history of crude oil. In the 1800s, crude oil was early stage technology and it was tradable just like bitcoin right so people back then were having this debate about why is this black tar crap that comes out of the ground that you know native americans used to to glue together their canoes like why why is this suddenly worth so much oh now it's worth nothing now it's worth a lot now it's worth nothing you know it was early stage technology is often not tradable it's locked up in safe agreements and y combinator and you know these little murky worlds of venture capital Crypto's early stage technology that's very transparent, very out there in the open and very liquid, much like oil was in the early days. Oil was early stage technology. And so, yeah, I guess just to wrap this thought up, like if you're if you're w thinking about it just as a, something that doesn't produce value like cash flows, you're ignoring the bigger picture, which is that commodities and crypto are inputs into a into systems that basically underpin the entirety of humanity, right? And <laughs> and humanity produces lots of cash flows. So it's it's that variable in the equation. It's not it's the input, not the output, you know? Jonah, I'm so with you on this. I, I I've sort of come to the conclusion that there are just going to be some people that never wrap their head around that or get comfortable with it. It's always like, I need to see my yield and I need to see my my dividend or my cash flow or whatever so I can model a DCF. And you, you've seen a lot of attempts at that. To, to do exactly like that with something like Ethereum, which has always fallen flat to me because I like that this isn't this isn't a company. These aren't re these aren't returns that are being reinvested and compounded. These are that's not what we're looking at here. Hey everyone, wanted to give a quick shout out to this episode's sponsor, Copper. Copper is an institutional custodian and provider of prime services within digital assets. Today, what I want to talk to you specifically about is Clearloop. Clearloop is a solution from Copper, which to me solves one of the biggest problems for market makers, high frequency traders, hedge funds within digital assets. You know the exquisite pain of what I call the pre-funding problem. So if you want to take advantage of arbitrages that pop up across different exchanges, or you just have a tra trading strategy which requires you to be active on multiple different centralized exchanges, you have to pre-fund your account at each one of those exchanges. Now, this is not ideal for a whole bunch of reasons. One, you have to take counterparty risk from those exchanges, which as we saw this last year, can have major consequences. Two, 
it's capital inefficient. You have a whole bunch of assets spread out there. Most of them are not doing anything most of the time. And three, it's just not great from a workflow standpoint and it creates administrative overhead. So enter Clearloop. Clearloop is the secure MPC custody solution provided by Copper. The way that it works is you deposit your assets into this MPC solution, which is owned and, owned and operated by you. Clearloop syncs up with a whole bunch of your favorite exchanges, and then you can trade securely from Clearloop itself while not taking any counterparty exchange risk with any of these exchanges. And it's a super easy and nice UX. Now, Clearloop is trusted by the likes of Flow Traders, Brevin Howard, Nickel, some of the best in the business. But the coup de gras is in the extreme edge case that one of these exchanges were to go bankrupt, they have a very clever trust structure which segregates your assets and keeps you completely protected. So click the link at the bottom of this episode, especially if you're a hedge fund and market maker and you want to learn more or better yet, Dimitri, the CEO, is actually going to be in person on a panel hosted by yours truly at Digital Asset Summit. So DAS London, that's March 18th to the 20th in London. So you should definitely click the link at the bottom of this episode, give your boy some credit, but also even better, come to DAS London and hear from Dimitri himself. All right, cheers everyone. Thing, one thing that you might be interested in is there's a really great biography of John D. Rockefeller called Titan by a guy named uh, Ron Chernow. And he describes the early days of the oil industry. And this was pre one thing that I'm ashamed or like just kind of embarrassed that I didn't know before reading this book. I assume Standard Oil was built on the back of gasoline and automobiles, but not at all. It was kerosene. And actually, they they discarded all of the, the basically what we'd consider crude today as effluent in the in the river, uh, Cuyahoga River. But if you if you go back and listen to his description of the early days of the oil industry, it was exactly like crypto is today boom bust, very short term, very speculative. There are these description of entire, you know, villages basically being constructed in the span of a couple months. You know, everyone's gambling, speculating, all this stuff. And then there'll be news of like a gusher, a bunch of supply coming online, prices will tank, the whole industry will go out. <laughs> I mean, it's it's just incredible. It was it was a gold rush, literally. Right. Uh, and yeah. You know, look at what gold's done since the gold rush of San Francisco in 1849, right? Like, yeah, okay, fine. You have some bad times. If you get it on the highs, you're you're going to face some financial ruin, whatnot. But you have to stick with these things. You have to time them uh, if you're going to play them in, over the short term. And if you play them over the long term, uh, I think, I think crypto is going to be the best investment of uh, two generations, millennials and Gen Z. Like, I, I really think that I think everybody, not financial advice, do your own research, blah, blah, blah. I think you should, I think everybody in younger generations should have a substantial amount of money in crypto, in benchmark crypto, based on what it's going to do, which is basically what oil did from the you know late 1800s uh, until today, probably on an accelerated time frame in crypto because we live in a, a hyper-connected world. Yeah. Jonah, uh, I'd love to get your, you know, we will return to crypto but i, I want to get your your sense of like what's going on in the macro so you return to the world of commodities and trading obviously because you saw a massive opportunity you know we're this is the first we're recording this on you know jan 16th we're just heading into the new year i would love to get a sense from your perspective of kind of the higher level macro you know what your sort of cyclical and maybe longer term um sort of secular outlook on commodities is as well yeah i mean it's a great question so Against the backdrop of, I think what what everybody expects to be a declining interest rate environment this year. You know, Goldman just came out and said they expect five rate cuts this year. Uh, you kind of have this tailwind for commodities, right? Easier monetary policy means weaker dollar means stronger commodities. So, does that mean that all commodities are just going to explode to the you know sort of Ukraine war highs that they had during these like big inflationary supply shocks of 2022? Well, no, right? There's there's plenty of spare capacity, meaning that producers of commodities like crude oil they could produce a little bit more. They're not maxing out right now. There's plenty of oil in tank. Uh, there's plenty of gas being held you know under the ground. Uh, the, these networks that transport commodities from places where there's too many. To places where there's not enough, you know, they're pretty, pretty robust, pretty liquid. So we, we may not get this like crazy crisis level spike, but ultimately, what, what's going on in commodities right now is we're going to see easier demand. I do expect society GDP growth continues to you know surprise to the upside. I think that productivity gains unlocked by new technologies like ChatGPT, just making everybody a little bit better at their job, you know, better research and better knowledge 
you know, better able to code and all these things that creates, uh, that, that creates productivity gains that ultimately enhance society's demand for commodities. Um, and ultimately, like, I think that you're going to have this sort of secular uptrend across the commodity space for the next couple of years that the rising tide will just lift all, all of these different ships. Um, honestly though, part of the reason why I'm so excited about commodities trading right now is because the, the post Ukraine war environment has torched liquidity. And so a lot of the, you know, not necessarily just like price trend stuff, but like a lot of the little like bells and whistles, the relative value trades, those suddenly look amazing. And so, um, that, that is kind of what, where I see the immediate value capture. And then over the long run, I think it's going to be a big price uptrend. Um, ultimately though, I still think the absolute, the part of the reason why I felt comfortable moving back to commodities and leaving crypto professionally was because I no longer feel as though I need to be a professional crypto trader to reap gains from crypto. I don't need to be in the weeds trading it all day, every day. I, I see in the wake of FTX, I saw just the most spectacular bull trade that, that I think I've ever seen in my entire career. Like I, I was bullish a little too early. I was bullish in parts of 2022 where I shouldn't have been. Uh, I risk managed it appropriately and I got quite long on the lows um, in after FTX. And then when I realized I was going to be leaving to go back to commodities, I effectively like replaced the position that I had at work with personal capital and my personal account. And I, I don't really touch it. I did that one big trade and now I feel like I'm in the situation where all the relative value relationships in the market I know best, which is crude oil, are all out of whack. You do need to be at an institution to trade those differentials and those, those spreads and those cracks and those east-west arbitrages and all these crazy little niche swaps. Eastern NAFTA versus European NAFTA. You can't do that in your PA. Crypto, honestly, I might be missing something here and I probably disagree with a lot of the crypto community, but I think the best risk reward is just being long Bitcoin, ETH, and Solana, set it and forget it. And then, you know, professionally trading commodities and having that, you know, subsidize, you know subsidizing, a, you know, crypto length in my PA, I feel like I can have, kind of have the best of both worlds. So that's why I sort of felt comfortable making this move. It was just like a strategic kind of optimization game. But, um, also, there's a lot less risk professionally trading commodities than there is professionally trading crypto. Um, I, I don't know why, but certain regulators don't like crypto, but they don't really give a fuck about, you know, what you're doing in uh, in gas oil swaps. So, you know, yeah, it's almost like it's not 100 percent logical. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't follow 100. percent yeah. So, all right, Jonah, just to track that, maybe to sum up the current situation in commodities is there's a really attractive. A position for you as a trader because there is essentially a, a massive wrecking ball that got swung into the global energy apparatus and a whole bunch of efficiencies that were operating before all got moved out of whack. So your more arbitrage oriented brain is like, hey, I can I can close those ARPs. And that's like a very good. Arbitrage is a, is a probably it's a appealing word, but it doesn't describe uh, what I'm doing as, as well as uh, systematic relative value. Uh, arbitrage literally means taking no risk, right? Like you right. just buy some buy something in place A and sell the exact same thing for a higher price in place B. That's arbitrage. That's you know that's definitely low risk, right? Relative value trading. Some rubber band gets stretched and extended, and you know it's gonna you know snap back, snap back, but it could stretch a lot more before it does and stop you out. So relative value trading is real risk risk taking. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Um, that's that's really helpful, actually, just a, a curiosity framework there. Um, what about, I mean, in terms of the the longer term drivers of the of the commodity market, I mean, how much do you pay attention to to things like, you know, you mentioned like a weaker dollar. So are you paying attention to things like the deficit, uh, GDP numbers, all that kind of stuff? You know, we're recording this today. There was a massive, you know, a leading indicator on the empire um, uh, manufacturing uh, service it was like in, printed like a negative forty three seven or something like that, which is one of the. And they were expecting negative five, um, so it looks like uh, you know we're at this sort of interesting moment where, you know, we're running extremely high fiscal deficits. I think annualized the the fiscal Q four number came in at half a trillion dollars. So annualized, you know, in the neighborhood of, of you know, two trillion or a two trillion dollar deficit, which is absolutely bananas. I guess that could in theory lead to a weaker dollar. You've got yields turning lower, but at the same time, you've also got 
labor softening, and you've also got um, leading indicators for economic activity moving lower. So how do you how do you piece all of that together? Yeah. So macro trading, and now as a you know somebody who's traded credit, FX, uh, you know oil, precious metals, and crypto, I, I definitely have a macro mindset. Um, just having traded all these markets, there's this just spectacularly enormous matrix of data that's getting fed to you through a fire hose every day. You know, you mentioned in, in the last sentence, empire manufacturing, consumer confidence, like <laughs> yields, know. dollar. It, there's a lot, right? And, and yeah. it's overwhelming for most people. So I think the best thing to do, like the way that I try to learn new markets is I try to um, stress test ideas to their extremes. So let's just like, I don't know what empire manufa- like, okay, if empire manufacturing data comes in at an extreme negative number, right? Like we're going into a recession. So that's not really useful for me to learn from. Um, I think what's more interesting is like, what happens if you take the national debt to GDP ratio to an extreme? Let's just say, okay, it was like 30 to 60% for most of, you know, the last century. It, it like topped out. I don't remember exactly, but like a little bit above a hundred after world war two. And then, you know, took three decades to come back down to a normal band. Now we're running hot. We're running at a, we're running a debt to GDP of like 120 plus percent. What happens if that goes to like 500%? What then? Right. Um, I, I don't know, but it, the, the one thing I do know is the price of Bitcoin is going to be $10 million a token because the the whole economy is just going to be so over levered and chaotic that the dollar probably won't be necessarily the most trustworthy global reserve currency anymore. Maybe in that scenario, you have math-based currency that everybody's sort of accepted as as digital gold. Maybe that'll uh, Maybe that'll be getting adopted by central banks around the world who are currently holding dollars or, or tra- dollar-based securities. In terms of commodities, <clears throat> like we touched upon earlier in the podcast, commodities are range bound. But when one of them really blows out to the upside or to the downside, it's usually a leading indicator that there's a problem with demand or a problem with supply. So right now, commodities aren't really showing any real signs of stress. So not really focused too much on that. Um, so I don't think you're going to see any any economic hardship or, or euphoria coming out of the commodities market in the near term. Uh Yields coming down, however, that is extremely important. That just means that against this backdrop of us having already over levered ourselves as a nation way too much, and um, you know things are probably running a little bit hotter than they should be. The austerity that we should have eaten in 2008 and again in 2020, but instead we just stimulused ourselves away from that austerity. Like it, it hasn't gone away. It's just living inside of our our over levered economy, and now they're cutting rates again. Right? They're cutting rates, I know. which means that that like. <clears throat> the the profligacy is effectively just continuing. So to me, that just means bo- borrow and buy, borrow and buy real estate, borrow and buy Bitcoin. Uh, don't, not with too much leverage, though. <laughs> but borrow and buy, um, borrow and buy the S and P five hundred. Like um, it, it to me, it just seems like uh, one of those. You know, pay, pay floating though. Don't pay fixed. Don't lock in current interest rates. Like just borrow uh, in ways where you you can get more levered as, as yields come back down. Does that make sense? It does. Jonah, what do you see as the end game here? I mean, you mentioned kind of a, uh, I mean, maybe it's a hyperbolic situation, but maybe it's actually something that's that's pretty realistic at this point, that debt to GDP goes to something like 500%. I, I suppose, w- what is the end the end game for that or the, the forcing function? And y- even the rates decision is such a funny thing because it sort of feels like at least the zeitgeist from, from my perspective has went from higher to longer and the Fed's going to keep raising. There's nothing that would make the Fed cut. And all of a sudden it's, well, of course the Fed's going to cut because they think that financial conditions are tight enough. And you know now that inflation is falling, they have to cut rates. It's like, okay, well, yeah. We all just memory hole what everyone was saying three weeks ago. Uh, you know, so <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'd be curious, like what what your thought was about this pivot. Do you think it's something that's irresponsible? And then what, what's your end game on on all this debt? And then maybe we can get into Bitcoin. Ultimately, I think I, I do think that it is irresponsible. I mean, I think that ultimately, you know, nobody wants to hear this, but they should really just cause a cause the, some you know some sort of a small recession. We're we're overemployed right now. We're over levered. They, if they were running the country like they, you know, like intelligent people run a business, you would want to sort of pay down the debt, um, you know, cause things to slow down a little bit, and stop mortgaging the future of younger generations to, you know, basically pay out pay out the 
the and net present value that a bunch of boomers have just uh, accumulated over the course of a spectacular bull run over the last 15, 15 or so years. So since the financial crisis. So ultimately, to me, I think they are running it too hot. And I think you know, nobody in Washington has an incentive not to run it hot. No one, no one gets billed for, you know, too much debt. No one, no one, no one, no one gets, sorry, no one gets like billed in the sense that they get kicked out of their elected office. For right. This, right. They, they get rewarded for splashing money in their districts and their, their jurisdictions and on their, you know, constituencies. They don't get punished for, mortgaging future generations, uh, you know, payout. So ultimately I think that where this all goes, cause you mentioned the word end game, where this all goes is the incentive system in Washington continues to churn out this sort of like, all right, we're not going to let things run insanely hot to the point that we get fired, but also like our inflation target isn't really 2% ever again, we're going to more synthetically have it be like four or 5%. We're going to keep borrowing and it's effectively just a form of stimulus. And what that ultimately means is that anything that's denominated in dollars becomes more expensive and especially uh, alternative reserve currencies like Bitcoin. Yeah. Let's talk about those alternative reserve currencies. So probably the thing that we should discuss, you know, a, a landmark event that's been a decade in the making since the Winklevi first applied for one in back in 2013 was we had we got our slate of Bitcoin ETFs. So I think we had 11 different issuers get approved. We had the GBTC, Grayscale Bitcoin Trust uh, get converted successfully. So there's a bunch of AUM that's tied up in there, although I think there's been some exodus, although not a massive amount of exodus, although I'd love to get your your more expert opinion there. You know, what are your thoughts on, um, I know probably the first week or so doesn't really matter, but like, what was your thought on the the amount of inflows and trading that happened across the suite of ETFs? And then maybe we can start breaking down some of the longer term implications. Yeah, I mean, I think people were expecting just this sort of euphoric single day, uh, massive inflow that didn't happen, right? Billions and billions of dollars come into crypto. Finally, it's been debottlenecked. No, I, I don't think I've ever called for that specifically. Like if you just think about it from the perspective of your grandpa or, or some no coiner who's like finally been convinced or somebody who's been sitting on the sidelines wanting to invest in crypto, but they don't want to like KYC themselves on Coinbase and pay a 1% fee and have to wire money in and out of some like, you know, some institution that they're not familiar with, right? This ETF really unlocks a lot of, uh, unlocks a lot of, op you know, de-bottlenecks a lot of inflows. But if you think about the way that like in the private wealth space inflows tend to work is you you receive a cash flow from something right you sell your company or you get a big bonus at work or or something like that happens and then the way that like a private wealth manager will allocate that to the market they won't be like okay great yeah you know you, you made this money so let's just stick it all in the stock market all at once normally they'll sort of like spread it out over over a, a few weeks or months uh you know just so that you aren't exposed to like one one bad price, right? They don't, no one wants, no one wants to be responsible for investing all of a client's money in something at the absolute high point at, after which it tanks. Uh, they could get fired for that. Meanwhile, if they just like rateably invest it throughout time, a professional investment manager, and the price happens to go down, then they're averaging in, or if it goes up, then they're, they're averaging up. You know, it's, it's basically just like, it's common sense that um, investment, the investment world uh, has a, a, sensible defense for effectively spreading investment flows throughout time instead of just like piling in all on day one, especially on, with all the hype that's going on in Bitcoin. So I think that this ETF will cause, the ETFs, sorry, will cause billions upon billions upon billions of dollars of passive, you know, hodler, hodler investment inflows that people just, you know, dentists and your grandma will be stashing 1% of their portfolio in Bitcoin, that'll happen slowly. But in the short run, what did surprise me and what I think is far more pertinent is the mega volumes that went through in these contracts. And yeah. I think what that tells you is like, hey, TradFi wants to trade Bitcoin. They haven't really been able to that efficiently until now, which I, I totally could see it at DRW. We had our own like massive, massive mountain Everest of technology and, you know, legal protections and, you know, tentacles into every possible little pocket of the market to make sure that we could trade spot effectively and safely and in a, you know, professional manner so that we, we could survive all of the craziness, right? Like 
most institutions don't have the time or the patience or, or, you know, they weren't in early enough to build all of that. Now they don't have to. Now all the rails are there for them. So like you're, what you're seeing when you see these huge, huge volumes, <clears throat> it's not just like the companies that have already built it, like Jane Street and Tower and Citadel and DRW. It's, it's the companies that haven't built the rails, but do have all the signals and the technology, just HFTing the fuck out of this asset class, like DE Shaw or, you know, maybe, uh, Infinium or Optiver or whatever, like you're gonna you're gonna see lots and lots of trading. This is the most interesting, volatile new commodity to trade. And finally, a lot of trading companies can can just get in there and trade it. But you know, just to finish this thought out, volumes attract investment, right? You want to invest in things that are liquid, not something like cheese futures that trades once every three weeks, right? And yes, that does exist. So basically, like if you see tremendous battleship liquidity in Bitcoin and there's all this volume, you probably feel comfortable sticking a wad of money in there. Whereas if it's gappy and grayscale and there's discounts, legal problems, lawsuits, and you probably won't, right? So I, I, I am so bullish I can't see straight for a variety of reasons, including these ETFs. Hey everyone, we'll be back to the program in just a moment. But before we return, wanted to let you know about DAS London. DAS London is the largest institutionally focused conference in crypto hosted by Blockworks. But I wanted to give you an update because we are now 10 times oversubscribed for this conference. So the bad news is we have actually got to lower, as much as I love you guys, the listeners, we've got to lower our discount rate to margin 10. That's going to get you 10% off. I would highly recommend that you do that soon because you might have noticed ticket prices have gone up 200 pounds and they're only going up from here. And I actually can't guarantee that we're going to have this discount rate forever. Since we last talked, we've had a whole bunch of new great speakers sign up for the conference. We've got Brad Garlinghouse as a keynote. We've got Pascal Gauthier as a keynote. We've got new speakers signed on from Goldman Sachs, from Franklin Templeton, uh, from some of the largest family offices and allocators based out of Europe. So Theta Capital Management, L1 Digital. And actually on day one of the conference, we're going to be having an investor day, which is a Chatham House Rules hosted by some of the largest investors in crypto. Then the other thing that happened is we've got our VIP tickets that just went live. There are only 60, but we've actually had a bunch of them that just sold out even in one day. So if you want to be a VIP at the conference, make sure you get your ticket. And again, use code MARGIN10 uh, to hang out with me and Mark uh, March 18th to the 20th in sunny London. Cheers. Let's talk about the long-term secular drivers for investing in Bitcoin. So obviously there's the currency debasement that we've talked about before. Maybe that's the maybe that's the main driver. And now maybe as a mental model for folks who are listening, we're reducing frictions or unlocking new sources of demand by just making Bitcoin easier to access, which is largely how I view the ETF. So maybe that wasn't this immediate catalyst that was going to spur Bitcoin to, you know, 50 or 60 or however many thousand dollars your your price target is. But what it does is now the next time that catalyst ends up coming, and maybe that's a shift in rates or a broader risk on back in the market or whatever it is, then that pump is going to be that much higher. Is that is that the framework that you have for it? Or what are some of these reasons that you're so bullish you, you can't see straight about it? <laughs> well, I mean, first of all, in order to basically the, the way that you construct a macro thesis, a long-term trend that you can ride, which is ultimately the, the best thing best best way to make money in macro trading whether it's oil or bitcoin or you know copper or anything else you have to find the big macro mega trend and usually what that involves is something that's like a multi-part thesis right so one is deep bottlenecking institutional investment right another part is the having so that's just a stock and flow problem if miners are selling x bitcoin per day and then after April, they're selling X divided by two Bitcoin per day. That's, you know, against the backdrop of, of however much buying has been supported, you know, ingesting that that selling over the course of all these years that Bitcoin's been around. You know, the theoretically, the buying flows are still there and the selling flows are having. So, you know, that's 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 another component to this bullish thesis. Another component to the bullish thesis is rates coming in and the dollar weakening and uh, fiscal profligacy continuing. Another is the slow drumbeat of um, <clears throat> geopolitical kind of conflict and the division of of the the you know the global trading ecosystem into these kind of Orwellian hemispheres that, that we're seeing. China and Russia banding together with Iran and a few other countries that are antith antithetical to. United States and the United States sort of creating its own NATO fiefdom 
um, you know, somewhere in the middle there, you have, you have a bit of strife and, you know, lack of safety of passage for ships. Ultimately, like commodity trade lanes sometimes need to go in between these, in between these hemispheres of influence. And increasingly that as the dollar gets weaponized, like you need a new, effectively a new currency that can perforate these hemispheres that's acceptable to both warring, you know, counterparties. Bitcoin, I don't even think it's like a dark horse anymore. It may take 20 years, but it like I, th- I think it it is the next global reserve currency, possibly in our lifetimes, and it doesn't need to be you know eighty percent of global trade denominated in Bitcoin for it to have the crown. Like we could go from zero basis points of global trade being denominated in Bitcoin to like one percent in the next five years, and you know the price of a, a Bitcoin is five hundred thousand dollars just on that alone. So that's another component to this thesis. So once you start to stack all of these like macro mega trends together. Um, you know, to me, to me, it looks like the <clears throat> basically the most obvious investment of my lifetime and something that I don't have to actively manage. However, what I would say, one reason why it's so hard for people to, to, you know, pile into this up until now, you, you couldn't do it easily without wiring money to a gateway like Coinbase or FTX or Binance, which is scary after FTX. And another reason is just the volatility. A lot of people can't seem to stay in this fucking trade. And that's why, you know, on Twitter, I'll just recommend like, don't, don't trade, just hold on, look at something else. But everybody on Twitter, Twitter, like it's not enough for people to be long Bitcoin or long ETH or long staked ETH earning yield. Like they, they feel like they need to just know what the next bonk is and buy it after it's run up, you know, 190,000% from the lows. Like I, I don't get it as a professional trader. Like I, I would have been out of the game 17 years ago if I, if I'd been like that, you know? We were we were talking uh, about someone, a, a mutual friend or acquaintance of ours before the show, and he gave me, uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's an accomplished sort of macro guy, and he gave me this very funny framework for how to think about retail participants in a market, which is to think of retail participants as three-year-olds. You know, have you ever taken a three-year-old somewhere and, oh, ah, it, everything is the first time and it's all emotion and it's great, or like you're crying, and that's basically what retail people are like in a market. And the, you know, there's this great quote. It's like, there's nothing so horrible for your health as seeing your neighbor get wealthy. I mean, that's what it's like to be a person in crypto. And yeah, hey, I've got this this pile of money and it's more than I thought it was ever going to be. But I've also seen this other person that did a thousand X on some meme coin. And why did why did they deserve to get that and not me? It's it's a hilarious psychology. I agree with you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it impacts me too as a professional trader. You know, when I look at some of the fortunes that just total, total morons earn and in trading sometimes it's, uh, I'm not going to pretend that I have this like sort of monastic Zen, uh, attitude about it. Like even after seeing, you know, 1500 people make more money than me, you know, just in, in, in the companies that I've worked for, like, it's, it's sort of like you still, it, it's still just like messes with your mind a little bit. And, uh, I, I, I do everything I can to avoid thinking about it, but we're all human. It, it's tough. It's tough to watch. You know, I, I think if it's like, somebody put 10 bucks into bonk and then that 10 bucks is worth, you know, a hundred grand. Um, you know, I, I think that's, it's, it's hard to replicate that person's success, but you know, other times you can watch, you can watch somebody put like a million dollars into Bitcoin and turn it into a billion dollars. And you think Bitcoin could still run. And that's, that's when your head starts to screw with you a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We can decide later. If I, so the first Bitcoin actually that I ever owned was in 2011. So you can maybe take a guess at how I found that big, but I, I didn't hold on to it. You know, I, I didn't. It didn't even actually register to me that this would be. I was in high school at the time. It didn't register to me that I would be an investment. But it was actually. I do remember this because someone described it to me. I was like, "What is this Bitcoin thing?" I was like, "It's an internet dollar," and the time the price of Bitcoin was a dollar. And I was like, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, an internet dollar. It's a, it's a dollar. Yeah, so maybe it is good to be a three-year-old sometimes because like the the adults in the room back then were like, this is nonsense. This is fraud. And, you know, my my three-year-old will look at something with a perspective I've never thought of before and I'll, you know, could invoke side-splitting laughter or like an, oh my God, he's smarter than I am moment, you know? So, so you know, good for you. for And I guess good for the three-year-old retail investors on Twitter <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. Just please stop trading. Like, okay, if you're going to go into this meme world, and treat it like the casino that it is. If you're like, I'm going to crack open a beer, sit in front of my computer, 
when with 10x leverage, I'm just going to have meme coin night at the at the casino. Like that's okay, right? At least you're playing a game for entertainment and you don't expect to make money. If you're actually trying to like like you know, set aside your friends and your loved ones and your day job to like attempt to turn this into a sustainable source of income. Like g- good luck. It's just not going to work. Okay, Jonah. So by the way, and just to underscore, lest anyone leave this podcast thinking that I made an intelligent decision, I did not hang on to that Bitcoin. So that was not a flex. That, I absolutely did not hang on to it. But uh, here, here's something that I want to get your opinion on, Jonah. If what we're seeing here, maybe Bitcoin is the one example of something that's actually more money-like And so there isn't as much of a ceiling on it. But let's say there's this other shorter and longer tail of other layer ones like Ethereum or Solana or, you know, now you've got Celestia as as new examples of commodity-like things. And, you know, what we've just said is there are periods of time where it's great to be in a commodity trade. But the reason guys like Jack Bogle don't like it is... The, the one the one knock on commodities is it doesn't compound, right? It doesn't just go up forever, right? It, you, you have these extreme um, dislocations in the price that become attractive on a 5, 10, even maybe 20 year time horizon. So how do you how do you make a coherent worldview of this idea of just hodl, don't try to trade it with the idea that these things are commodities and there will be a point where hodling is not actually the best strategy long term? Great question. So... Okay, so let's go through them. It, let's bucket them. So Bitcoin, for all the reasons I just said, I, I think you hang on, you hold on for dear life. Ethereum and Solana, I think they have, they both have a relatively, you know, as good a chance as any of becoming world computers. <clears throat> and in that world, you know, if you have like a, a chance to invest in the early days of an Amazon Web Services, but a decentralized one that people might want to use for slower but perhaps more important transactions. Uh, that can be public or or private or or you know shielded. However, like if you think there's a high probability of adoption, we're still early enough that buying one of those and hanging on for dear life, it's kind of like kind of like uh, oil in the late 1800s. You know, if you if you're like, wait a second, this can produce light, and I don't have to burn whale oil anymore. Like, oh whoa, maybe society will pick this up. Uh, you know, let me let me hang on to some. Like th- to me, that's enough of an investment thesis. You, we're not we're not in a late stage commodities trade where the drift is zero. We're in an early stage commodities trade where society is just discovering the use case as an input, right? So, ETH and Solana, I think, you know, satisfy the world computer prerequisites, and you know, you're you're probably safe in those um, with some percentage of your portfolio. The rest of this stuff. I mean, <clears throat> I would invest in interesting applications like Helium, Hive Mapper, uh, anything that allows decentralized compute. Like, if there's even a half a chance of that working, like it's it's probably worth in in options trading. You call it a flyer, you know, like a a, a low delta call option, something that doesn't cost you that much. You don't spend much money on it, but it could thousand x, right? Like if Helium suddenly spins up like a a T-Mobile or a Verizon for a fraction of the price, like you, you want to have some on on the books, right? Probably won't work, but if it does, like good stuff. As for the rest of this stuff, like I, I think you're supposed to look at this uh, the entirety of crypto, like Helium and Hive Mapper. Like, let's call a spade a spade. For all the hype you see on crypto Twitter and on Telegram, the deep, you know, if you're digging deeply into the space, you are an extreme fringe minority, right? Most of the world does not give one flying fuck about this technology or what it can do. They're interested in digital gold. They're interested in owning a bit of the world, the world's future decentralized computers. And they're not like using these chains to accomplish anything that, that they can't do outside of these chains. The UX is terrible. Um, you know, it, it just doesn't, to me, it isn't like something that you can play without a real system, you know, if I, I like, so I'm kind of sitting back and waiting for users to come, frankly. It's risky. And a lot of the valuations don't make a lot of sense. It, you know, one thing I'm very curious to get your perspective on, Jonah. So again, we're recording this on January 16th. We're going to be together in London in about three months or January. Jan- Two months. Two months. uh, For DAS London. And I'm trying to think to myself, you know, from a programming standpoint, things move so quickly in crypto. And okay, we've got the Bitcoin ETF. That's great. BlackRock's going to be there. We're going to talk about that. But I'm literally wondering to myself, is that going to be in the zeitgeist even two months from now? Or are we going to be moved on to an Ether ETF? Or 
Larry Fink has been on TV doing his little press circuit talking about tokenization. And I don't know if you caught this snippet, Jonah, but he said tokenization solves, <laughs> what do you say? Tokenization prevents all um, like fraud or something like that. Shoot, I literally just, uh, but I mean, it's like, wow, that's a, I wouldn't have said that on air. <laughs> that's a pretty crazy thing to say, I think. So, I, you know, I, I mean, how much, how, how quickly do you think we move on to other products, things like tokenization? I'd just be curious to get your take on the whole Larry Fink part of this cycle. And- I'm glad you brought it up. I mean, so, okay. So first of all, just to, in, in the spirit of staying sober about crypto, like an ETF is not a use case. It unlocks crypto rails as an investment and trading vehicle. It is not like the world deciding that something is better on chain than off chain, right? So that's that's the sobriety moment. Now, let's get excited. Crypto is a better way of moving value around than any other way. It is the internet of money. We all, we all know, and we in crypto know that if you want to move something valuable from person A to person B, you can do it in seconds on on chain. And you know, for example, I just moved uh, some money market funds and ETFs that I hold from one brokerage account to another. Uh, shit took two weeks, and and brokerage account B vacuumed up too many securities that they won't, weren't supposed to from brokerage A, and now it has to get sent back. So that's another two weeks. This is a month of of like like pick your pick your word like friction or nonsense or max pain this is this is unnecessary back office it back office as a as like a slice of global financial industries is like so enormous that that it's so spectacularly large and unnecessary uh now that crypto is here like and also the other thing in a world of, of non-zero interest rates mike like transactions like a stock transaction you go and buy ibm stock right or sorry you sell ibm stock you don't get your cash until t plus two t plus two business days right so that could be like four calendar days if if it's if you sell it on a friday and what that means is like your money is like there's literally something on the order of tens of trillions of dollars locked up that could be getting put to good use in or get earning yield in this world of high interest rates. So it matters now, right? So ultimately when Larry Fink is talking about tokenized securities, what he's talking about is like T plus 10 seconds instead of T plus four days. He's talking about Jonah moving stocks around from one account to another and all this fungibility and, and liquidity and ease of access to capital and to securities is important because what it means is you can effectively securitize new things quickly. Like as a com- and this is where uh, crypto merges with commodities. Like if I'm an oil trader, I don't have to only trade Brent and WTI because those are the two benchmarks that the NYMEX and this and the uh, the ICE, these two exchange monopolies in their various regions, set up 30 years ago. Like I can spin up a tokenized market for, um, <clears throat> you know, Agbami, uh, a type of crude oil that comes from Nigeria, if I'm Nigeria, and I can trade it with the other refineries around the world who care about Agbami, and I can link it to the price of Agbami, which I produce. You know, literally these niche markets that no one's ever heard of because the CME doesn't give a fuck about them can get tokenized and spun up. Suddenly you can have value transfer between counterparties that care, and markets do solve problems, right? So I think Larry Fink's right to wrap this thought up without rambling too much. I, I hope he goes and does it, but I don't want to bet that he's going to do it on one chain or another. Like to me, it seems pretty clear he's going to do it on Ethereum or Solana. He's not going to create BlackRock chain. He's going to create like an L2 on one of those two chains. Uh, interesting. Why? Why do you think he won't create BlackRock chain? Out of curiosity, I, I I think he he won't create BlackRock L1 chain. I think he'll create BlackRock app chain on top of something related to Ethereum or Solana because. Um, other, otherwise, what he's doing is basically just uh, Bla- BlackRock chain already exists. It's internal to BlackRock. It's called Aladdin. And they're famous for that system, and basically that is the back office system that runs global finance. So if he's just talking about like creating a centralized BlackRock product that that tokenizes securities and it's just like a PR version of that, then you know may, I, I just don't think he's full of I don't think he's that full of shit. Like I think he's actually I take him at his word when he's when he talks about the promise of crypto. I don't think he's just talking about like 
spinning up a, a public version of BlackRock's back office and not having it be a decentralized chain. And BlackRock knows nothing about running validators or running nodes or whatever. Like that, that's not their thing, you know. It's a really good perspective. I uh, I, I think the I think the idea it, that I've at least heard about and thought about is that it's it is going to be like a BlackRock chain, but I, that's actually a really compelling counterpoint. I would say, um, like maybe he spins it up on base, or maybe maybe, but the base is on Ethereum, right? So ultimately. Like it may be in an institutionalized BlackRock chain, but I I would be stunned if it weren't basically sitting on top of an Ethereum or Solana Solana ecosystem. If it's an entirely new like vertical L1, like near or polka dot or something that's just like its own little world, uh, I I would be I would be blown away. That's a really good point. All right, so I know we're I know we got to wind down here in a second, but Jonah, you know, maybe if if you could give us your view on. You know, people talk quite a bit about, okay, what happens when BlackRock move into the space? And maybe they don't have their own BlackRock chain, but they've got their roll up. And then ultimately, we all end up doing KYC for to interact with, interact with BlackRock. And are we eroding the values or the value proposition of an open, permissionless, decentralized financial system that crypto creates? How, how would you answer a question like that? So I believe that the open, permissionless uh, system that crypto creates... I, like I'm not a techno anarchist. I'm not one of these people that's like anti KYC, but I, I do think that it's useful to have an open, permissionless, decentralized uh, sort of internet of money because, like I was saying earlier on the podcast, it allows people, you know, people who don't necessarily agree with each other to transact, right? And I think that's important for humanity, and I, I do believe in that from a, a like from the perspective of a commodities trader who shifted oil from, you know, Nigeria to China. Uh, like I, I believe that people should have access to, to trades with people that other people that they don't necessarily agree with or that their governments don't agree with. So I think it's important as like a, a baseline concept, what, like, and that's really what you have with Bitcoin and ETH. Um, I don't know about Solana, I, you know, we can debate that, but that, uh, that's for another time. But ultimately if there are, if there are app chains or L2s sitting on top of the public networks, that involve like tremendous amounts of institutionalization, KYC and protections for investors and, you know, things to prevent criminals from laundering money and stuff. Like, I don't, I don't care. I think that's probably for the best, right? That probably prevents another, um, another FTX from happening, frankly. So like, to me, I think you need that stuff. I think you need that stuff. And, and it's not, I think it's important for the crypto natives to remember, it's not just the open permissionlessness that makes crypto crypto. It's the, it's the value transfer, like this best in class technology for transferring value peer to peer between two people without an intermediary that don't know each other, right? Like that's also what makes crypto crypto. And that can be KYC'd up the wazoo and still <clears throat> beat T plus two. It can still beat BlackRock's, you know, back office. It can still beat everybody's, everybody's sort of like mountain of emails and phone calls and things that, that aren't really necessary. So like, it's the, it's the tech and the ethos together that make crypto uh, so useful to society. And you don't always need to be invoking both uh, in some sort of like higher philosophical agenda. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think it, you eloquent, that was very well said. I, and my own mental model for it for a long time has been, have you seen these, these sort of representations of, or these like graphic images of like two galaxies colliding together and their stars kind of get all intertwined and then they go off in their own separate. I think that's basically what's what's going to happen with crypto and TradFi as well. It's, they're going to combine in these new, interesting ways. I actually think it's ultimately going to be a lot of the the values of, because ultimately crypto is better tech. It's a better tech upgrade. There's this very long history of the arc of change of history being decided by not local policymakers who almost always to a T fight it but technological change over the long uh technological innovation drives change over the long term so um anyway jonah this has been phenomenal buddy it's always great when we get to catch up um can't wait to see you in person soon and if folks want to i guess find out more about you follow you uh, you're pretty active on twitter uh you know what's the best way for them to i don't know just follow you yeah follow me on twitter jvb underscore xyz is my handle um listen to the thousand x podcast uh with, with avi Feldman. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. It's it's great to geek out about macro and crypto together. Really passionate about this. Same, sir. Same. Jonah, this was fun. We'll have to do it again soon. L Likewise. Let's definitely do it soon. Cheers. Cheers.